Hello, everyone, and uh, welcome to today's webinar. Really excited to have you all here. This is the last in our monthly series of webinars that we've been hosting all year as part of our Currency Convo program, and uh, it's really great uh, to have you all here today. My name's Stephen Dooley. I'm the head of Market Insights. I'm based out of our office in Melbourne, Australia, and I'm here with Boris today from our office in Austria. Thanks a lot for joining us today, Boris. Pleasure to be here, Stephen. Thank you. Fantastic. So we'll give it another moment or so and uh, let everyone join the call. But uh, as I said, uh, very excited to be able to present this the last webinar for the year. As I already mentioned, um, my name is Stephen Dooley. I'm the head of Market Insights and joined here with uh, Boris, our global macro strategist. And when we think about what we've seen uh, so far um, this year, and particularly what we've seen in November, um, it's been a really significant period in markets, a real sea change in expectations around the future outcome um, of markets. And it's really been driven by a shift in expectations, not just about Federal Reserve, uh, but uh, central banks all around the world. But if we look more at the Federal Reserve throughout November, um, a really significant change where um, at the start of the month, the uh, key Federal Reserve decision, the chair, Jerome Powell, said that the outlook for the US economy was now more balanced. And that was a big change from the last 18 months where the major concern had been inflation and controlling inflation. Now the Federal Reserve said that uh, the risks were more balanced, so growth and the risk of over-tightening. We then saw the weaker than expected US jobs report. Uh, 150,000 jobs came in, one of the rare times over the last two years we've seen the US jobs number miss expectations. And then, of course, inflation came in lower than expected as well. So those three events, the Fed decision, the weaker jobs, the lower inflation number, really saw markets believe that the Fed has now finished the end of its rate tightening cycle. And if you look at the market pricing now, believe that the Federal Reserve will cut rates five times uh, with 125 basis points of cuts priced in over 2024. Now, of course, that has a very significant impact on foreign exchange markets and markets more generally. And if you look at markets more generally, we saw the US 10-year bond yield tumble from above 5% at the start of November to around 4.25 now. So a very significant drop in um, bond yields, 75 basis points on the US 10-year. And that drove a um, big move higher in US equities, the S&P 500 up 8.9% in November. That was the best monthly gain since July 2022. And really, as Boris will touch on, it was the everything rally because not just bonds, not just equities, but even in commodities, we saw at the start of this week, the gold price hit an all-time high of $2,135 US dollars per ounce. And so, as you often see in financial markets, um, uh, collapse in interest rate expectations, falling bond yields just drove a supercharged rally. That's in the broader financial market landscape, but in the FX market, what it had was a very clear impact on the US dollar. And the US dollar fell very sharply, down 4% in November, the US dollar index. That was the biggest monthly fall since November last year. And you can really see in terms of the, the level 
how quickly that move was. The US dollar index fell from 11-month highs at the start of November to three-month lows by the end of the month. And as we ended into December, it even touched four-month lows. So a really significant reversal in the US dollar. And that was the main driver, um, the main impact that we saw in FX markets, that collapse in the US dollar. And that saw um, markets right around the world jump sharply higher. Notably, the British pound was up uh, quite significantly versus the US dollar um, and, and jumped only to within 3% of its 18-month highs and close to that post-Brexit vote average around 129. So a big, sharp jump that we saw in the British pound. Um, it has started to drift back lower over the first couple of days of December. But overall, the major move was that big spike we saw in the British pound. The euro was also stronger as well versus the um, greenback, um, but not quite to the same extent that we saw in the British pound. It did push higher up to that 110 level, but that 110 level has been really key resistance on this market. And again, we saw it drift back lower once it got to that zone. Um, you can see we quote there that over the last 18 months, less than 10% of the time, um, the trading days, the euros has spent above 110. And again, that level acted as really key resistance. The reason why the euro underperformed um, is in particular that inflation number that we got near the end of November. Inflation, headline annual inflation in the Eurozone fell from 2.9 to 2.4. If you cast your mind back to the middle of this year, um, inflation in, in the Eurozone and in the UK as well um, was red hot um, and particularly driven by energy prices. But um, in particular, the Eurozone has seen inflation come down very quickly. And so, as Boris again will touch on, one of the major themes is central banks right around the world are expected now to have finished hiking rates. Maybe there's one or two exceptions, though. One of them is Australia and the other is New Zealand. And that's why the Australian dollar was one of the largest beneficiaries last month from that US dollar weakness. Aussie jumped up to four-month highs, but uh, the margin of the move was really quite significant. <laughs> and as I mentioned, while most central banks around the world look like they have finished hiking rates, the Reserve Bank of Australia um, actually raised rates in November. It was the 13th rate hike since May 2022. And inflation in Australia appears to be more sticky um, during the month, during November. Um, inflation came in at 4.9% in annual terms. Like we mentioned, um, in the EU, um, that result came in at 24 uh, In the US, it was close to 3%. So headline inflation in Australia higher than other parts of the developed world, and that's starting to provide some support for the Australian dollar. So that was how November played out. The Federal Reserve appears to be on hold. Markets have moved very quickly to price in rate cuts. The risk is that we've been here before. The start of this year, financial markets expected four rate cuts for 25 basis point rate cuts from the Federal Reserve. And you might remember that in January this year, we had a red hot inflation number from the US. Those rate cuts were quickly priced out. And in fact, we've spent most of the year getting further increases in interest rates. So that's going to be the big risk as we go into December. Have markets moved too far too fast? Have they overestimated the likelihood of the Federal Reserve cutting rates next year? That's all going to be driven by some major macro pieces of information that we get over the next month or so. So I'll pass over to Boris now and he'll be able to focus really more on the global economic outlook, that macro outlook, and then I'll return in a moment with uh, our update on our FX forecast. But now, it's over to Boris. Boris, 
Sounds good. Well, um, thank you very much, Stephen, for again setting the scene so nicely for us and a warm welcome to everyone joining as well from my side. As you perfectly summarized in your first slide, we are just coming from really one of the best months for risk assets in almost three years. And as always, my part of the presentation and my contribution to the webinar will be all about explaining the drivers behind this capital rotation into equities, as you said, into bonds and away from the US dollar. And we will also have a brief look ahead into December to once again answer the question of how likely is this trend to continue. It is important to remind ourselves on the next slide that globally investors came into November against quite a negative backdrop from a risk perspective because US macro data had been incredibly strong and hawkish Fed speak had pushed up the US 10-year government bond yield for six consecutive months, um, touching a 16-year high at around 5%. And this drastic move pretty much set the tone for the rest of financial markets with the euro falling, the Aussie falling, the British pound falling, and the global equity index pushing lower for three consecutive months. And then, as we said, November has been pretty much the best month for risk assets this year in what some have called a broad forward Santa Claus rally, because European and US stocks have recorded four consecutive weekly rises against this backdrop of not only falling stock market volatility, but also more importantly, falling bond market volatility. And bond yields across the board, across the curve, and across countries have fallen as well. Most notably, again, the US 10-year government bond yield, the bloodline of global financial markets, going from just above 5%, a 16-year high, as you said, to now trading below 4.25%. So this, for us, obviously back the question of what happens to turn this gloomy outlook in October upside down in just a matter of a couple of weeks. And for us, it's really about these, I would say, free developments in particular that have been responsible for not only the US dollar weakening, but also global stocks pushing higher. So the first one that you mentioned in our publications is that US Eurozone and UK inflation surprising to the downside in November. The second one is that signs are emerging that the US labor market is cooling. And lastly, that G3 central banks have decided not to raise interest rates at their last meeting in November. And this led to the largest monthly drop of the Goldman Sachs Financial Conditions Index in the US in recent history, which kind of exemplifies how impactful these three events were for risk assets and for markets in general. Because taken together at these three, four points that we mentioned, investors have really felt comfortable to start pricing in significant rate cuts from not only the Fed, uh, which is the most important central bank we are looking at, but also from the European Central Bank and from the Bank of England going into 2024. Even with those policymakers still loudly pushing against any speculation that they would, would um, that they would ease monetary policy next year. So let's look at those three drivers of the risk really a bit closer on the next slide, starting with inflation. Because on the price front, investors have really been sharing the fall of, of in, um, inflation in recent weeks. So zooming in on the first chart here, we can see that the current inflation rate is at or near two-year lows in most countries we are looking at. Um, and while we're still some distance away from those pre-pandemic levels, which are highlighted by the bottom of the red bars, the recent progress made in the fight against inflation has really been welcomed by not only policymakers, but as I said, also investors. The latest acknowledgement of this narrative has come in the form of the latest inflation prints in the US and in the Eurozone, where inflation had fallen to 2.4 and 3% respectively. And again, we have to acknowledge that this is a global trend, but the magnitude of this disinflationary trend has varied across regions. Inflation in the UK, for example, and in Australia is still quite elevated at around 4.6 and 5.4%. And this for us is one of the reasons why the pound and the Aussie dollar have outperformed the broader FX space. On the next slide, we can um, see the second development in, in kind of the context of what is driving the risk rally in November, which has been the easing of labor markets in particular, but more broadly, just a weakening of economic activity. 
We have noted that labor markets in most countries still remain incredibly tight with unemployment rates now below their 20-year averages. However, as the economic cycle turns, starts turning, and this weakness from the pro-cyclical parts of the global economy, meaning the manufacturing sector, global trade, um, the property market, once they start to spill over into the services sector and labor markets, and secondly, as these higher interest rates start taking effect, we do expect the consumer to weaken in 2024. And as I said, this is still not fully visible in the lagging data. The unemployment rate in the US, the UK, um, even Germany, has so far only risen by 40 to 50 basis points. However, most leading indicators are still pointing to further weakness ahead. And this is something that markets have recognized. Just to name the most important one in this context, uh, to not lose sight of the bigger picture, the last two weeks gave us the release of both US and Eurozone purchasing manager indicators. And the subcomponents of these surveys that track the development of employment fell into negative territory for both regions, which is normally something that only happens during recessions and that actually precedes the rise in unemployment rates. And this, I think, brings us neatly into our third and last theme um, on the next slide, because this economic data has started disappointing expectations, so have the implied probabilities of those three central banks hiking interest rates in December basically fallen to 0%. And we can see in this chart quite clearly how the global tightening cycle is coming to an end with 2024 shaping up to be a more accommodative um, year from a monetary policy perspective. Because not only have major central banks decided not to raise interest rates in November and will most likely not raise interest rates in December, markets are now pricing in around 500 basis points of cuts from the BOE, from the Fed, and from the ECB over the next 24 months. So these, I think, three, four developments have really been key in shaping November. Because on the next slide, um, again, as we mentioned numerous times during this presentation, the last month has really been a remarkably strong one from a global equities and global risk asset perspective. Equity markets from Germany, the Eurozone, US, UK are all between 0.5 and 5% away from reaching their all-time highs. An implied stock market volatility on both sides of the Atlantic has fallen to post-pandemic lows just last week. In the US, the equity rally is also broadening in, in scope, which is quite important to note, even though the tech stocks are still the largest driver of the recent move higher in the benchmark index. So looking, for example, at the year-to-date performance of companies like Microsoft, Meta, Apple, NVIDIA, these companies are up around 35 to 70% in 2023 alone. And they have clearly outpaced the overall benchmark because if we just look at the S&P 500, um, the index is up around 20% this year. But 75% of these gains come from just these seven companies, which are famously known as the Magnificent Seven. And excluding these companies, the stock of these companies from the overall benchmark gives us a sobering year-to-date performance of just 4.8%. Looking more broadly across assets, as Stephen mentioned, gold hit a new record high this week as yields on fixed income products like government bond yields have fallen. And even Bitcoin hit a 20-month high above 41,000 US dollars based on, again, strong risk sentiment and positive news surrounding a new Bitcoin ETF potentially coming out in the US. So this has really been an everything rally um, as investors have cheered the peak in interest rates in most developed countries. Going to the next slide um, and kind of trying to answer the question um, that I posed in the beginning on the look ahead into December, we can once again highlight, I think, our three main drivers of the November risk rally. And we can simply ask, are these themes likely to continue into December and into Q1 of next year? Because if they are, if central banks are done raising interest rates, if the US economy slows at a moderate level, and if inflation numbers continue coming down, there's no reason for equity markets to stop rallying, and the US dollar will remain on the defensive. However, if some of the assumptions don't stand the test of time, if they don't stand the test um, of data, some correction to market positioning is expected to occur, um, given the stretched positioning in equity markets and the complacency 
of investors. And one good thing for us going into December is that the whole month, or at least I would say the first three weeks of December before we go into holiday season, will give us plenty of opportunity to answer those questions with, um, with a lot of data coming our way. The first theme I would like to focus on is, again, the monetary policy theme. We have discussed it numerous times. The major central banks will meet in December for their last policy setting of the year. When, while we do not expect any interest rate changes in the US, the UK, and the Eurozone, um, we're still expecting new insights from these updated projections from the central banks on, again, economic uh, uh, growth, inflation, and interest rates as well, especially given that, as I said, policymakers are still kind of pushing back against these rate-cutting expectations from markets and investors. The second point is, again, the labor market. The next U.S. non-farm payrolls report will come out this Friday and will once again be highly important, especially given that this November risk rally that we have been talking about was partially fueled by jobs growth coming in well below the consensus number in October. So in October, the U.S. economy added around 150,000 people to its workforce, less than economists have expected. And this again fueled this risk rally and markets and investors pricing in rate cuts from the Fed. Now for November, um, US economists are expecting growth to pick up to 180,000. And it will be important because if we see a pickup, this could be the first uh, test to this risk on sentiment that we have seen all across November. And lastly, secondary data points will also be crucial to kind of gauge how much central banks will cut interest rates next year, especially given that um, we are quite sensitive on incoming data, central banks and markets are quite data dependent. And this is the reason for why they're now looking at every single data point to gauge how likely these rate cuts really are to materialize. So retail sales are important, industrial production for many countries are coming up. And of course, the most important soft leading indicator, the purchasing manager index will also be closely watched for the US and for the Eurozone. The inflation print on the 20th in the UK will be kind of the main market driver, the main macro event for the UK for this month, given um, that inflation continues to be much higher than in other parts of the developed world. And this has partially, again, helped the pound recover some ground versus the euro and the US dollar. Uh, so it will be interesting to see if this diverging inflation trend between those three countries continue to hold. Again, as I said, we'll have more than enough data coming our way in the next three weeks. But looking more broadly on the next slide, not at specific macro events, but more so about the main narrative that will shape December. Um, I would say that currently markets um, are priced for perfection. And that could in and of itself be a risk to this sentiment-driven rally because markets are both positioned for a soft landing in the US, and for the Fed to cut interest rates. And normally these two conditions wouldn't really be compatible with each other, but because US data has weakened enough in the last couple of weeks for investors to price in these cuts, but not enough to cause a panic, this Goldilocks environment has been created in November. So if this, um, if this narrative prevails, risk assets, as I said, would likely continue to outperform. However, we see two scenarios where this would not be the case. So the first one is, if US macro data starts going from just bad, as we have it right now, to outright recessionary, then the US soft landing narrative will fall. At the other end of the spectrum, if US data outperforms expectations by really a large margin, this would put the chances of rate cuts into question. And I think both scenarios where US data outperforms expectations and is much worse than what expectations are pricing in for, both scenarios would lead us to higher market volatility going into year's end, especially given the currently suppressed levels of volatility, as we have seen in my first chart, and complacency of investors. We think that the first scenario of the US economy continuing to slow is probably the most likely one, um, because if we look back at 2023 in general, two things have really kept the US out of recession this year. The first one is the incredible strength of the US household, and elevated consumer spending. And on the other side, US companies really being insulated from the Fed's tightening cycle because US corporate interest expenses as a percentage of cash flows have actually fallen to a 40-year low of 
when the average rate since the 1980s was around 17%. Um, and this is due to US companies having to borrow during the pandemic and during this low rates regime. And this is what caused the average interest expense to fall naturally to an all-time low. However, as we said, the longer the Fed and other central banks keep up interest rates, the more will companies feel the effect of this tighter monetary policy, which is what explains our below consensus forecast on not only global growth going into first half of 2024, but also US growth, respectively. Last thing from my side, um, going from this macro to kind of the effects side, we think that investors are still trying to assign a hierarchy to these G10 central banks based on the likelihood of them easing policy in 2024. Because over the last couple of weeks, the more rate cuts have been priced in for a certain central bank, the more the currency has um, weakened in the last couple of weeks. And the Fed and the ECB have really led the pack in terms of kind of these policy easings and rate cuts being priced in, followed by the Bank of England. The Australian Central Bank, for example, is still expected to maintain policy and not cut rates throughout the whole of 2024, which is, again, one reason for why the Aussie dollar has been strong versus its peers, at least looking um, into November uh, exclusively. So this is, I think, for me, one reason, again, for why and, and how macro shapes affects in the first place and why we start with the global overview in our webinars before we dive into our currency-specific outlooks. So I think with this information in mind against this backdrop of the macro data, I can now hand over to Stephen, um, who will give us an overview on our FX calls going into 2024. Thank you, Boris. That was absolutely fantastic. And uh, what I liked most, um, I think, was really identifying that what we've seen in terms of move over November is really clearly telling us that markets are now priced for perfection. And a lot of the times when um, it comes to managing foreign exchange risk, it's not really um, necessarily about trying to predict the future. It's more about identifying where the risk is. And after a huge move that we've seen right throughout markets in November, uh, the risk is that um, the fact that markets have moved into an environment that's almost too good to be true, the risk is, well, what if things turn out not to be too good for, to be true? So that's really what we're looking for. Can markets maintain this current environment of being priced for perfection? And if they don't, um, what does that look like? So let's start off by looking at the British pound uh, because, of course, um, that uh, the, the British pound had a very strong month in November. If you look at the cable, the British pound versus the US dollar, um, you know, we were around 120 uh, at the start of October. We rallied up towards 128 by the end of November. We've drifted a little bit, a little bit further. So can this very positive market mood remain in place? And if it doesn't, what does that mean for the pound? So certainly looking at where some of the biggest um, moves, the largest volatility we've seen um, in the last three months or so, um, clearly the pound versus some of your more um, uh, commodity-focused um, currency. So the pound versus the South African rand, uh, versus the Norwegian krona. Uh, in both cases, big moves, 8.5% over the last three months and 6.5, uh, 6.4% um, uh, in the last three months. Uh, but also really big moves versus the um, US dollar. Look at that trading range over the last three months. Like we say, that rebound from 120 to 128, 6% range in the um, pound versus the US and um, also close to a 6% range in the pound versus the 
Japanese yen. Um, and again, in both of those um, markets versus the US dollar versus the yen, right near the top of the range as well. Uh, 83% of the three-month range versus the US dollar, 91% uh, versus the Japanese yen. So really redlining the British pound in terms of that strong performance. And as we mentioned, the risk is um, what if markets uh, calm down from that very optimistic view of five Fed rate cuts next year? What that could potentially mean is that the pound starts to drift back lower, particularly versus the US dollar. Where we've seen um, some um, uh, less volatility, uh, again, the pound versus some of the European markets uh, where... um, This year has really been driven by the expectations of very high inflation throughout Europe, including uh, Switzerland, including the Eurozone, including the UK. And as those expectations for very hot inflation came off, um, those markets tended to move in tandem. So that's why you've seen less volatility in the pound Swissy and in the pound Euro, um, but uh, certainly uh, more significant in terms of some of the moves uh, that we've seen uh, in those markets. But uh, as we say, uh, volatility uh, quite low. Where's the value? Where's the opportunity out there versus the historical average as well? The pound, like most markets, up at um, you know, multi-year highs versus the Japanese yen. You can see versus the year average, um, almost 8% above its year-to-date average, um, 8% above its one-year average, 12%, 13% above its two-year average, and an incredible 24%. Uh, above its five-year average. So um, certainly for yen buyers, um, real opportunity out there as well. Also versus the Chinese yuan, the Chinese yuan has been very weak this year. It had strengthened somewhat um, in November, but the pound outperformed. And then you can also see real opportunity on that value um, scale uh, versus the CAD, um, versus the Kiwi, and versus the Australian dollar as well. You know, nearly 5% above it. It's um, well, 5% above its um, five-year average versus the Kiwi and 4% above its five-year average versus the Aussie. Um, still under pressure in some other markets uh, versus the uh, Euro, pretty much in line with its uh, long-term averages and um, certainly um, underperforming versus the Swiss franc. Let's drill down and have a little bit more closer look at the um, British pound because that's had a, a very strong run um, over the last two months. As we said, around 120 at the start of October, up at 128 uh, or near 128 at the end of November. It's come off quite significantly, come off two big figures um, already in the first part of December. And that certainly, as we say, identifying where the risk is, um, is that if um, the that extremely positive, optimistic mood that gripped markets in November, if that doesn't continue, then the risk is that the pound US can drift back lower. And you can see our core range for the next um, three months um, between 118 and 124. So um, for now, um, above that range uh, does appear to be an opportunity for your US dollar buyers located in the UK. So for now, um, a, a, a good rally in November, but for the moment, our core view uh, is that uh, the pound likely to uh, drift back lower towards that baseline scenario. Um, in the uh, pound versus the um, the euro, uh, again, a market where we've seen quite a significant move in the pound's favour over the last um, over the last uh, couple of um, a couple of weeks. The uh, the the euro really underperformed uh, recently, uh, in line with um, uh, that weakness that we saw from that inflation number last week. So that's brought the um, the the pound uh, up towards uh, 
um, two-month highs uh, versus the uh, euro. So again, uh, an opportunity out there at the moment for your um, pound or for your uh, euro buyers in the UK. And that's mainly been driven uh, by that um, inflation number. Uh, that said, you know, around those levels, um, it's, uh, you know, historically been um, key resistance for the um, the um, key resistance for the uh, pound euro and uh, that suggests that uh, the risk is that we can start to drift back lower uh, in that pair so again um, certainly another opportunity out there uh, for your euro buyers located in the UK um, let's look more closely at the euro because again um, that's a market that uh, certainly benefited quite significantly uh, from that US dollar weakness for most of November but then started to lose some composure. We already mentioned uh, that the euro US dollar has seen quite key resistance up at 110, and that looks to have played out again in November up to that level. Then that inflation number that inflation number came in below expectations and again confirmed that 110 level is quite key resistance. So um, that's the dominant theme as we sort of end November and uh, start December. In terms of where the biggest volatility, again, like we saw in the British pound, uh, some of these commodity markets have uh, seen some of the highest levels of volatility. Euro knock, Euro czar, um, both continuing to see high levels of volatility, uh, 7% um, over the last three months in the Euro NOC and 6.4% um, in the Euro ZAR. Euro Yen, like all the Yen pairs, really um, redlining at the top of um, its uh, range, as you can see here, 85% of the three-month range, 94% of the year-to-date range. That Yen weakness, really a dominant theme in terms of FX markets at the moment. Um in other markets, uh, like we mentioned, um, in the pound, um, the euro has had a similar set of circumstances where the volatility has been a lot lower uh, versus other European markets because this year has really been uh, driven by those inflation expectations and markets have broadly been looking at the um, Swiss National Bank uh, the Bank of England and the European Central Bank is broadly moving in lockstep because uh, of high elevated levels of um, inflation uh, across the broader uh, Europe and uh, UK um, economy. As we look at where the opportunities are for um, in terms of um, relative to historical averages and again uh, that yen weakness just really showing up in the euro yen um, around 8% above its year to date and one year averages 13% above its two year and 23% above its five year averages um, of course markets have been waiting for that other shoe to drop from the Bank of Japan, when are they going to signal that they're ready to start tightening policies that can see a reversal in that market very significantly, but for now, uh, we haven't seen anything along those lines. Uh, the euro relatively high versus the Canadian dollar uh, versus its um, historical averages, uh, particularly over that two-year time zone uh, time frame, up uh, 5.5%. 5% versus the two-year average. Um, again, a uh, lot we'll touch on uh, at the moment, but uh, Canadian dollar, particularly uh, this month, underperforming um, as the oil price fell. Um, and where some of the uh, biggest moves to the downside, like we already mentioned, um, with the euro weaker versus the pound, um, you can see the euro pound um, around that 86 level, even lower now um, around that support zone, around that um, 85 cent mark. Um, so uh, 85 pence mark. And um, that's been historically uh, quite a key level. So again, another reason why that euro weakness might have started to play out um, to its fullest extent uh, in the euro pound and the euro Swissy as well, of course, right down here in terms of value also. Um, 
Okay. So um, let's have a look. Uh, and again, um, looking at the euro, and it's a similar story to what we've said is the risk in the pound US is that this move in the US dollar um can it be sustained? And we've seen previously that markets have moved very much ahead of themselves in expectations of a sequence of Federal Reserve rate cuts. If they do not occur, then the US dollar can rebound. And particularly going into some key US data this month, as Boris already mentioned, with the non-farm payrolls and inflation Fed decision in the middle of the month, um, if we do start to see that markets can't justify that view of five rate cuts next year, um, then that's when we can start to see that these markets, which are priced for perfection, are unable to maintain that view. And that's what could see the euro, US dollar lower. And like we said, again, quite clearly rejecting around that 110 level, really key resistance has been all year and looks like that's playing out again. So that's why our core view for the euro US dollar over the next few months is in that range between 103 to 107 so um, certainly um, we think uh, you know in the uh, eurozone for US dollar buys um, opportunity up around 107 does present itself okay from the eurozone let's move over to north america and of course that's really been defined by that weaker us dollar story most currencies have been able to outperform particularly emerging market currencies and um we've seen that right throughout the world and uh in the um north american market of course it's the um dollar peso where we've seen uh some of the largest volatility this year Three month range at 10.7, year to date range at 17.4. And again, uh, that's what we've seen uh, in, in, in a lot of other markets. We mentioned that some of the big moves when we're looking at the European markets was in the commodity space, but it's also really been seen in the emerging market space. And that's what you expect to see in a period where markets have outperformed very strongly. Equity markets are higher, interest rates are falling, tend to be good for commodity markets. Um, and in the um, uh, emerging markets as well. Um, like we said, the, the, the exception is that uh, the CAD, which of course has had a strong month in November, but it did underperform versus other currencies, um, versus, for example, other commodity currencies like the Australian dollar and the New Zealand dollar. And that's mainly uh, because of two factors. Uh, first of all, the Aussie and the Kiwi, both of their respective central banks, are really still banging the drum in expectation that it might need to raise rates further. And in fact, the RBA did raise rates. Um, so the Bank of Canada uh, looked less likely to hike, but also the oil price, which has weakened in November and really has weakened quite significantly um, after an initial rally after the um, attack on Israel from Hamas. Um, we saw crude oil rally in the weeks after that attack. Um, but as we have seen the conflict limited, uh, we didn't see any third parties like Iran dragged into the conflict. As a result, the oil prices really tended to drift lower and that's caused the CAD to uh, underperform somewhat over the course of the last um, the last month or so. Um, so again, you can see here in terms of volatility, uh, the dollar CAD right at the bottom in terms of movement. And um, again, uh, a bit like we saw in the Eurozone uh, where we're seeing um, the European currencies, the pound, the euro, the Swiss franc really moving in lockstep. We're seeing a similar story in the dollar CAD with those in, in inflation expectations broadly driven by the same themes. And in fact, we're seeing the same thing in Australia and New Zealand. Um, the um, volatility in the Aussie Kiwi right down at historic lows as well. 
because it's the same in regional inflation influences that are driving these individual currency blocks at the moment. Let's have a quick look at where we're looking at in terms of the value. And like everything we've looked at today, the Japanese yen under real pressure, uh, 25% premium to its five-year average in the dollar yen. Absolutely incredible, although it has turned quite significantly uh, from that 150 to 155 zone. Um, so uh, Mark is keeping an eye on that. We mentioned the Euro CAD in previous um, moves. Um, the dollar CAD, uh, you can see here, still broadly near its long-term averages um, and sort of finding support around that 135 level and seen a bit of a rebound from there recently is the similar story to what we're seeing in the um, the the pound, which has rejected that 128 level, and the euro, which has rejected the 110 level, the dollar CAD bouncing from the 135. So quite a synchronized move that we're seeing in those major US dollar markets. Let's have a quick look at the key markets that we're looking at. And again, um, as you can see here, uh, the risk, as we mentioned, um, is uh, whether markets can maintain this very optimistic view. If they can't, um, if markets start to price out some of those five interest rate cuts, Next year for the Federal Reserve, the US dollar can rally versus the CAD. And so you can see the core base case for the dollar CAD over the next three months, 135 to the downside, 139 to the top side. So certainly the risk still is that we can rebound from that support zone around 135 back up to those higher 135s. Um, you can see some of the scenarios that can drive a bigger move um, and in, in financial markets and um, really, uh, in particular, a more significant move to the downside uh, is going to come down to that um, any shift in market expectations from what the Fed does and what the Bank of Canada does. So that's what we'll be really watching in terms of that market. So certainly, uh, as we really mentioned, it's a pretty clear theme in November, and it's a clear risk as we go into December, a really strong performance in financial markets in November. We saw um, that... Um, uh, Big shift in expectations for central banks right around the world, boosting sentiment, pushing the US 10-year bond yield down from 5% to around 4.25, a massive move lower. And that, of course, boosted equity markets with the S&P 500 up 8.9% in November. Going into December, the risk is that can this optimism be maintained? If it can't, then the risk is that we can see the US dollar recover and that can start to see a further move to the downside in those key markets that we're looking at in the pound US, in the euro US, and a rebound in the dollar CAD. Um, of course, what we um, look to do for our customers here is to help them manage that currency volatility. So, you know, speak to us about risk management. You know, what if we continue to see a uh, material five to 10 shifts in your key exchange rates or in your target rate stays at levels significantly above or below your budgeted level? Speak to our team here. We can help. We've seen the big moves that are driven by geopolitics over the last 18 months. Um, we can help uh, again um, with providing those insights or helping your business put that risk management strategy in place to help manage the unpredictable shocks that you can see in financial markets. And even we saw with that sudden escalation of sanctions last year after the Russian invasion of Ukraine, uh, we were able to help on that as well with our um expertise in compliance so you know if you have questions reach out we're here to help we've still got a couple of minutes left so please if you have any questions use the q and a tab on the um uh, on the zoom controller i do have one here already and i'll shoot that one to boris but um boris a question for you um what central bank looks likely to cut rates first um, now that we seem to have reached the peak 
of interest rates globally. Interesting. Um, thanks, Stephen. So for us, it's probably the most important question going into 2024, because as I said, the inflation and the monetary policy outlook are kind of still to this day the key drivers of what is happening in the FX space. And getting inflation right, getting our forecast on interest rates right, means that we are getting FX right. So for us, looking from it, um, looking from it on a perspective of this hierarchy that investors are trying to assign to central banks, we are seeing at the bottom the ECB uh, still, as we have seen for the last couple of weeks, because not only is inflation getting ever closer to target, we are not at 2.4%. If you look at six-month annualized inflation, we are already at target in Europe. Um, but in, in addition to this disinflationary trend, economic growth has been quite weak, unemployment rates are rising, and most economists do expect Germany to fall into a recession in Q4. So given this weak economic backdrop, it is really likely for the ECB to be the first one to initiate this global monetary policy easing cycle, probably in Q1 of next year. The second one would then be the Fed. As I said, we are um, we, our economic growth forecast for the US is still below the consensus going into the first half of next year. And this, in addition to inflation continuing to fall, um, should probably give the Fed a bit of a leeway to cut interest rates as well, one or two months after the ECB. On the second uh, end of the spectrum is obviously the Bank of Japan, as you mentioned. I mean, the, the Japanese central bank is expected to most likely increase interest rates as the only G10 central bank next year. And the RBA in Australia is also not expected to change policy. So this is, I think, a good way to look at it from a hierarchy perspective. And I think it is also important to recognize that while policymakers have in recent times pushed back in, against these speculations, with inflation falling, with the economy weakening, they are starting to turn the corner. And some, even the most hawkish central bankers in Europe, are starting to come around to the fact that some monetary policy easing will be necessary to put the economy out of its recession in 2024. Great. Thank you, Boris. We've uh, got another question here just ahead of um, tomorrow's Bank of Canada decision and just uh, preview what might happen with that um, decision. Um, and I think this is going to be really interesting because you've already mentioned, Boris, that we've seen this shift from central banks around the world um, that now appear to be nearing the end of their rate hiking cycle. Um, we get that update from the Bank of Canada tomorrow, and it does appear that we could get some um, more uh, positive-sounding commentary around inflation. That They might sound more dovish, and uh, that could be a sign as well that they're also uh, nearing the or at the end of their rate hiking cycle and nearing the point where they can start to look at um, cutting rates uh, as we go into the first half of um, 2024. So again, this is going to be the um, the um, the the key driver, I think, of the dollar CAD over the next couple of days. Um, that we're seeing central banks right around the world moving to suggest that they're not as unfocused, not as focused on hiking rates anymore, and more focused on balancing the risks and potentially moving towards the ability to cutting rates. So that's the risk, I think, tomorrow uh, in the Bank of Canada, if they do sound um, more um, more dovish, uh, more likely to open to keep uh, start to cut rates, then we can see that dollar CAD start to continue to rebound uh, from that support zone we saw around mm -hmm. that 135 level. It's not a sure thing um, because, of course, Think about those similar commodity style um, economies, both um, in particular the Reserve Bank of New Zealand surprised markets last week by sounding a lot more hawkish, keen to keep rates higher. Um, we also saw today the Reserve Bank of Australia sound a little more dovish. So we're certainly at that pivot point at the moment. And I think again, talking about where the risk is, the risk is that the Bank of Canada sounds more dovish and the dollar CAD rallies. I think, Stephen, just to add another question that we have gotten on the importance of the labour market, 
because I think it is not as intuitive as we would probably expect as analysts. Um, but one question has been, why are stocks rising amidst weaker labor markets? I think that's a good point that um, our listeners are raising because normally you would expect with the labor markets easing, with economic growth slowing down, you would expect risk assets to have a harder time to find new all-time highs. But I think the most important thing right now is gauging how likely the U.S. central bank is to cut interest rates. And the more, the faster the U.S. labor market starts easing from its really tight position, the sooner the Fed can consider its job done. Because given that the Fed has kind of its two mandates, um, fighting inflation, uh, maintaining price stability, and then securing full employment, um, we can say that on the first part, the Fed did a good job. Inflation is going back to target, not as fast as they would have liked it to go, but um, still we are going into this direction. On the labor market, again, not so much. The unemployment rate is only 50 basis points from its all-time low. Uh, all-time low. And this is why the, the labor market, and again, uh, jobs growth is and will be a direct um, result and a kind of a direct function of how much the Fed can ease monetary policy. And the more they can, obviously, this is something that risk assets are really keen to price in. So this is why the labor market is, is so important and why investors are actually cheering bad data as good data right now. Great. Thank you, Boris. That's great. Got one more question uh, here, which we won't cover in too much detail, but uh, we've had someone ask, what's the possibility of onboarding new businesses? Of course, um, we're um, very happy to speak to um, businesses and, and new clients. Um, you can reach out to your Convera uh, representative. And of course, if I click through quickly, um, you can see the uh, contact details there to get in contact with us. And Boris, this must be a good juncture to finish up for the uh, session. I'd like to thank you for uh, joining the call and uh, you know, for a brilliant year in terms of macro analysis, what you've been able to deliver for us also. Thank you very much, Boris. Uh, thank you very much to uh, all the team for helping us put together these webinars, this monthly program that we produce. And uh, of course, thank you very much, of course, to our customers. I uh, appreciate you coming to these webinars and joining this. Uh, we hope you find the uh, information useful. Um, if you want to contact us, you can contact us uh, um, via the channels below. And I uh, hope you have uh, a safe uh, break if you get a break. And uh, look forward to speaking to you all again in the new year. Thank you, Boris. Thank you, everyone. And have a great day. Thank you. Bye-bye.